Hi, good afternoon, welcome. We are here in studio talking sports today. We're going to film our show a little earlier again this week here as we're going to be heading down to Indy for the Tiffany Valley Vikings taking on Bishop Chittard. We'll talk about that one in a few, but uh, should be a dandy. The Rochester Zebras, Val, they have the week off. They have a first round bye. We, we have not found an instance of a, a bye previously for Rochester, so... Something new here for the Zebras. They wait the winner of the uh, Lafayette Central Catholic and Winnemac game. So they will be on the road, we know, in week two. We just don't know if they're going to go to Winnemac or if they're going to head over to Lafayette. So we'll talk about that one coming up as well. For the Zebras on Friday night, boy, it was a wet one, wasn't it? Near Barnhart Field taking on the Conoqua Braves for basically for second place because, you know, we know now, but we didn't know then, but we've kind of figured that Peru would probably handle Manchester and take the uh, conference, so they did. And so it was a battle for second between Rochester and McConaughey. Right, and we've had really had great weather all, all year prior to Friday. In fact, I'd say we've had great weather for almost like two or three years now every Friday night during the fall. Yeah, the Manchester game was a little rough. Yeah. The homecoming game, that, mm -hmm. that was a little rainy there. But, yeah, it wasn't too bad, but... Uh, it was <laughs> it was definitely one of the wettest football games that I can remember filming in the yeah. last 10 years. And the Zebras adapted very well to it. I mean, they had 470 yards rushing in the game. Alex Deming was just phenomenal. A season high, 230 yards and two touchdowns. Colton Faverta had his best game of the year, uh, 136 yards and a touchdown, on a, what, a 58-yard run, I think it was. And Brand Beck went over 100 yards as well, 104 yards. So yeah. when you have three running backs over 100 yards, you're going to win many, many more times than you lose. Yeah, let's take a look here at some of the highlights from Friday night. And, you know, the one really cool thing with the with it being dark, you know, as early as it is, it kind of makes the lights really pop. And things were looking good for the Zebras right out of the gate. Yeah, that was that uh, kind of that inside counter play that they like to run to Brant Beck, and he gets down the left sideline, and he beats us very fast, A.J. Kelly, to the end zone for a touchdown, and that put Rochester up 8 uh, to nothing after the two-point conversion. This was kind of a weird play. They they go for it on fourth and three on a kind of a fake punt. It was a weird, was a weird formation. I, I don't know if you call it a fake punt because I don't think that was... Yeah, they weren't really in punt it, formation. It wasn't really yeah. the... And it, that wasn't really even the punter who threw the ball, and it was kind of a shovel pass. It just kind of looked like a bouquet at a wedding. Yeah. And Brant Beck came down with that for an unusual interception. And that's Rochester's second drive. And that was uh, Deming for a touchdown, I believe. Two-point conversion was no good, so it was 14 to nothing. Deming was wearing number five on Friday night with the uh, National Guard Yeah, uniforms. I was going to say... Uh, I don't think any, even though that was, uh, I don't think anybody was going, is that Alex Deming? Yeah, you I think can pe tell. People knew. You can tell. I think Alex. people knew. Yeah. Even though he wasn't wearing number 30. Yeah. And then this is, the blocking on this play is just sensational. Kelly gets, I mean, again, Kelly runs him down, but it's too late for a touchdown. And it was what, the blocking that, that got to him first, it was, uh, I think it was Brady Beck and Peyton Young also had a sensational block. Rochester scored touchdowns in their first three drives. And they led the game twenty to nothing after one quarter. Boy, Funny Kyle is just a terrific receiver. Ten more catches for 172 yards and a touchdown. This is just a great effort by him. There are just not that many athletes who can do that. Yeah, if you if you maybe you're used to. NFL numbers, but 10 catches for a high school player in one game, that's just crazy. And that is Deming off the right. That was a trap play to make it 26-7. to seven. But McConaughey drove right back down, and Braxton Burner threw his second touchdown on the pass of the game to Elliott. So it was 26-14. to 14. I had to put this one in here. This was a huge momentum changer with this. Right. We didn't know. He, he, right. You cannot catch a kickoff on the fly. You cannot catch an onside kick on the fly. So that was a huge switch because 
instead of McConnell having the ball around the 35-yard line, now Rochester right. gets the ball at almost the 50. Right. When you catch an onside kick on the fly, even if it goes past 10 yards, it's, it is not your ball. It is, and not only that, but it's a penalty. It's interference with the opportunity to catch a kick. Yeah. So... Of course, we never have seen that before because we've never seen somebody run down a kick 30 plus yards down the field and catch it. That yeah. was, you know, an amazing athletic play. But Congo was able to hold. And Burner able to. You know, McConaughey was in their two minute drill. They called the um, timeout. I think it was, this was the last time. This was the last play of the half, I believe. And it's, inter it's a Hail Mary, and it's intercepted by Zach Parks in the end zone. And so Rochester led 26-14 at halftime. I think that drive went 11 plays, but McConaughey got zero points. And this was maybe the biggest play of the second half. McConaughey goes for it on fourth and goal from the one, and they do not make it. What a job by Brady Beck and Peyton Young on that play. And then Rochester follows that up with a 99-yard touchdown drive, and this is Deming, 59 yards for a touchdown. And that made it, they would tack on a two-point conversion run by Brant Beck, and then made it 34-14. to 14. And, and you can see the, the rain really coming down hard in the second half. Yeah. And that turned out to be the only touchdown in the second half. McConaughey had a 19-play a drive at one point. Uh, they, they had three drives of over of 11 or more plays in which they did not score in this game. So they kind of had their opportunities. They were able to sustain mm -hmm. drives, but they, the Rochester defense uh, always came up with a big play, and then they would tack on that late safety. The backup quarterback was in, and I assume that was the backup center as well. Fell on it in the end zone for a safety. And Rochester beat McConaughey 36-14. to Zebras finished 7-2 and overall, 7-1 and in the conference. But as you mentioned, Peru beat Mc, uh, Manchester uh but 52 to 6, I think it was. Yeah. So Peru won the conference with an overall 8 0 record. Rochester went 7 and 1, and McConaughey went 6 and 2 and finished in third. Yeah. But I think it was pretty clear that those were the three best teams in the TRC this year. Yeah. Uh, very clearly, yes. Um, so, you know, Rochester, like we talked about, they'll have that first round bye. So they will be either traveling to LCC or Winnemac in week two for their opener. So. Right, then the polls that came, polls came out this week, LCC's ranked number 10 and Rochester's ranked number 12. Those are the only two teams that got any poll recognition this week, so if it came down to those two teams, that would be certainly a dandy matchup. Actually, the computer polls have Rochester ahead of LCC, though, yeah. for what it's worth. Yeah. But regardless, it, it, would, it figures to be a close game if those two were to meet. Yeah. Predictions are that LCC will win against Winnemac, uh, the Warriors, and we'll talk about them in a bit. You know, they... They'd won their last three, but they they fell on on Friday. So the uh, the Warriors go in with a, uh, a three and six record against the six and three LCC Knights. So right, and LCC playing very well. They won five in a row. Yeah. They started one and three. They they're now six and three, and they beat a four A team in Western last week. But we'll talk about them a little, a little bit later. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we'll we'll talk about that. Um, Rochester. Let's talk a little bit about the cross country. Is the sectional is uh, Saturday, and you know the. The wetness and the the dampness from Friday night. I think it was was it still raining or was it just really wet still? It was uh, it was not a pleasant day Saturday morning. Ye for yes, the and yes, and yes. Yeah. And but I think I think they I think they kind of enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. It was the it was the people who were watching. Yeah, were, yeah. It's it's usually different when you're participating than it is when you're you yeah know, just watching. But I think the kids tended to like the weather. I, I it was just uh, uh, you know I always say. Uh, it was interesting with Mike Inglehorn, the Valley Cross Country coach. He told Chesney Miller, he told her wear gloves next time because if you if your hands are warm, the rest of your body will follow. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but yeah, uh, for the most part, yeah, I, I didn't hear too many complaints about the weather. It was about fifty and drizzly. Yeah, yeah, you see that a lot with runners. Uh, they'll have you know a, a tank top and really short shorts and gloves. Mm -hmm. That's kind of their attire for when it gets cold. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, you want to keep those hands warm. And so, tell us how the uh, the zebras' uh, results were there for the sectional. Well, Rochester advanced uh, one girl, Allison Callaway, who finished I think around twenty eighth place. She ran twenty one fifty five, and then four boys made it. Uh, the team didn't make it. 
the team was sixth, and only the top five teams advanced. Mm -hmm. So that was a heartbreaker. But four boys advanced in uh, in uh, West Steininger, set a new personal best, seventeen twenty six. His previous personal best was seventeen twenty eight at last year's sectional. Okay. So he's definitely has taken a, a, a fondness to running at Manchester, uh, and then uh, you know Grant Bailey was back. Uh, ran uh, 18 11 and he advanced and then uh, the third was Reese Johnson ran 18 24 uh, a little bit of a disappointment for Reese he ran 18 minutes at the TRC meet at Manchester this was 18 24 but uh, you know Alex Goodman told him afterwards he goes you, you can't it happens on cross country you don't you don't run your best race every week I mean it just happens so I I think there's hope that, that Reese can, because Reese really wants to get into the 17s before mm -hmm. the season ends. He ran 18 flat at at TRC. So it, I don't think that they're not ruling that out. And then the fourth was Lane Shank, and I think that was just a great, great story. I mean, Lane running a personal best, 1836. I think he ran 1947 at the conference meet. He took over a minute off wow. <laughs> in two weeks on the same course. Yeah. And, I mean, that's great, because Lane was, is a kid who has just worked and worked and worked mm -hmm. to get where he is. and. I think everybody was just so thrilled for him. He was, he was wearing glasses, and his glasses were so fogged up that he actually took them off and he threw them to Matt. He saw Matt Steininger, Wes's dad, on the. Hmm. He just took them off and he flipped them. So he he ran the rest of the race with uh, no glasses. No glasses, yeah. but he could probably see better than right, he was seeing right. with his glasses fogged up. So, yeah, it's a great yeah, it's a great story that Lane made it. So, uh, so those five will be advancing to the regional at. New Haven, which is at the Plex, which is, I believe is on the north northeast side of Fort Wayne. Uh, coming up this Saturday, the boys' race will start at 10.30, and the girls' race will start at 11.15. Okay. And, again, there's no semi-state, so, top, again, top five teams and top 15 individuals on non-advancing teams advance to state. Yeah. So you said Rochester finished in sixth place. How far off of uh, advancing were they? 17 points. 17. Manchester had 168, and Rochester had 185. Again, the lower your score, the better in cross right. country. So, yeah, I mean, again, for a zebra team that had, again, and you know, Manchester is a team that's kind of been kind of a measuring stick for them for a, a long time on the boys' side. That was disappointing, but boy, that it's definitely a, it's a different sectional. It's a different world now. I mean, Wabash is in the sectional, Columbia City is in the sectional, Huntington North is in the sectional, plus the old standbys, mm -hmm. Warsaw and Culver Academy. So your first time with the new format for sectional for cross country, what are your thoughts on that? It's going to favor bigger schools, yeah, uh, because the sectionals has going to have more of a regional feel, mm -hmm. and the regional is going to have more of a semi-state feel. So it's definitely going to favor the bigger schools, yeah. And it's uh, for smaller schools, it's um, not that it's not that it'll be impossible, but you'll have to just take, you'll have a good team. I mean, you have to have a good team to advance because there's going to be an imbalance. I mean, and you can say that there's no way you can, if you're going to do it geographically, again, because people looked at the Rensselaer times and they looked at the Hunt Manchester times and it was just like almost two different sports were going on. I mean, mm -hmm. times were way, way faster at Manchester. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the smaller schools now, in order to advance, you're just going to have individuals. More right. Than likely. Right. Now, if you're Winnemac and you're watching this, you're saying, hey, what about us? Yeah. But I mean, that Winnemac was a small school at a the Rensselaer sectional, which was full of small schools. Yeah, yeah. A little I mean, different. the, the yeah. biggest school was Kankakee Valley, mm -hmm. has but maybe nine hundred or maybe a thousand enrollment. Yeah, you don't have the Warsaws and and all those schools. But at Manchester, running, yeah. again, you got Warsaw, Columbia City, Huntington North. I mean, that that's going to change. It's going to change the calculus of it all. I mean, mm -hmm. because uh, all of a sudden, I mean, because. I mean, previously it was Warsaw, and then a bunch of schools, you know, that were kind of similarly sized, and then a lot of, I guess you'd say, one A schools. Uh, now it's 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 different. I mean, it's not going to affect Warsaw that much. They won they won both the girls and boys team titles, but uh, it's going to affect a lot of the other schools. I would assume in a in a sectional like Rensselaer with some smaller schools, you had you know if you have fifteen schools there. You may have had more of those schools that didn't have complete teams versus right. what you had at, at, at Manchester. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. Right. And but I mean I would I, I would also say it's a concern all around that especially with girls cross country numbers seem to be down across the board, mm -hmm. and you would hope that that would uh, can turn around. Yep. 
All right. It, it wasn't just a Rochester issue. Anything else about Rochester cross country? We're going to talk uh, each school's team as we move through, but anything else about Rochester? Uh, that's all I have. Okay. Let's move over to Tipkinu Valley. They were at home for their final game of the regular season, taking on future conference opponent Bremen. And for the Vikings, uh, this would cap off the undefeated season, and they got started off with a Gage Overby field goal from uh, 30 yards out. Yeah, that's well within Gage's range. Yeah, that's like a chip shot for Gage. Right. <laughs> Anything under 40 probably is pretty easy for him, it seems like. But the Valley running game was tremendous, even without Nate Parker, even without Brandon Stiles, 391 yards rushing. Wyatt Hart was just sensational, 183 yards and four touchdowns. Bremen would answer really quickly, though, on the ensuing they kickoff. Would. Boy, this is kickoff coverage has been just a bugaboo for Valley for years. And, boy, I mean, it looked like there was opportunities to get him down, you know, several different times. Yeah. It, uh, probably had Coach Mo going a little crazy on the sidelines, I would assume. Right, and, and, you know, some of the injuries to Valley have affected their special teams as well. Yeah. Last play of the first quarter here. The Vikings get it in the end zone again. All right, they led 17-7 to after one quarter. Freeman says, well, you can kick a 30-yarder. We're going to kick a 38-yarder. Yeah, Bremen kicked... 34-yarder. Oh, yeah, Bremen kicked three field goals in the first half. And four different Valley players had rushing touchdowns in this game. You know, and it, and it wasn't just Wyatt Hart. I mean, Trent Marshall had 89 yards. I think, and 89 yards and just like seven carries, I believe. Was that all, Albert? Yeah, wearing a lineman's. Wearing number 66. Yeah. But if you need a if you need a yard or two, good luck trying to stop Dalton Alber. Mm -hmm. Of course, no different over at Valley. The rain coming down really hard there as well. Yeah, it was thirty one sixteen at halftime, and then they get a touchdown quickly in the second half to go up thirty seven sixteen. And boy, they run that inside counter so well. That is just a big part of their playbook. They made it 44 to 16. Wes Parker had two carries for 44 yards. And Wes is just a sophomore. We haven't seen Wes too much on offense. They've really been kind of wanting him to focus on defense. He's been playing a lot of cornerback. And I believe that was uh, Hart's last touchdown of the game, and that made it 51 to 16. And Valley would go on and win 51 to 16. Nine in our regular season. Yeah. Uh, second undefeated regular season in the last three years. Yeah, and <laughs> they're twin. Yeah, I mean their only regular season loss in the last three years was that game at Southwood last year, which came down to a last second field goal that they missed. Yeah. That many people thought they made. Mm -hmm. But still, they are thirty-one and two in their last thirty-three regular season games. But again, kind of like they had the last time they went undefeated, they've got a very, very tough test coming uh, this Friday with the number one team in the state, Bishop Chittard. Um, what What are your thoughts on Chittard? Obviously, their defense has just been just awesome, and, and they seem to be getting healthy. Right. Rumor is they're going to get their starting quarterback back, who hasn't played since the Gear and right. Catholic right. game. Which is that's what we're, we're, we're wondering about. And Aiden Arteaga is their starting quarterback. He's been out. Jack Harrington's a sophomore. He's been filling in. Harrington was great last week, 12 of 16. Yeah, they three, three, beat a team from Cincinnati, Cincinnati Elder. Yeah, beat them 34 to 7. Yeah. They lost to Elder last year, just mm -hmm. to put that in perspective. A, a Chitar team that went on to win the state championship lost to Elder last year. Mm -hmm. So for them to, to beat Elder, that's a big deal. And they, you know, it, and, they, and they did it with their backup quarterback. Jack Harrington is just a sophomore. So we'll see. We were assuming it's Arteaga, but, we'll, I mean, we'll be prepared for Aaron, 
Arrington, for uh, Harrington, excuse me, but Harrington, 12 of 16 for 154 yards and three touchdowns last week. So that's the, he's their backup. Yeah. So they've got two terrific linebackers in Feeney and Perica. Um, maybe both are maybe Division One type caliber players. They play a three four defense, but it, they are fast. Yeah. And in the, and we'll talk about this too. But they like to blitz too. They blitz more than a typical team, according to Stephen Moriarty. So the Valley will have to be communicating well in case they blitz. And then um, they've got a stud wide receiver in Colin Guy. I mean, he is. And you know, I just remember that Burbuff game when we saw the Burbuff play Mishawak and Marion a couple years ago in the semi-state. I mean, in a lot of ways, that's kind of what separates football in the Indy area to the football that we see is the quality of wide receivers. I mean, we talked about Fuddy Kyle from McConaughey earlier, but it just seems like every team in Indy has a Fuddy Kyle. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, a couple. Yeah, these mm-hmm. fat, tall, fast, rangy kids who can get up and high point a ball and catch it, and then. Get going down the field. I've seen some highlights of Colin Guy. He is very impressive. And the Waybright kid is another really good receiver. Um, and then the Shaw kid is a very good running back. 15 carries for 98 yards against Elder. So uh, this is a team that, you know, they're allowing nine points a game. The only two teams that scored more than 20 against them were Cathedral. Cathedral scored 21 against them, and, but they averaged 38, mm-hmm. just to put that in perspective. And then uh, Brebuff scored 23 against them, I think, in the season opener, but they averaged 33. So even the teams that kind of had some success against Chittard scored less than their average. Yeah, and it sounds like Valley's going to be without Nate Parker. And what's do we know about Styles? Is he going to be back? They're both going to be out again. Both going to be out again. And Grady yeah. Moriarty is going to be out again. I think right. they were they were had their fingers crossed that Grady would be back, but he's out too. So it's going to be why you know Wyatt Hart. You got to have Hart as a, yeah. Well, the old weird, saying you know next man up, right? Yeah. So and he he was just great, but I mean, again, this team has built depth with Hart and Marshall and Parker, mm-hmm. West Parker that is mm-hmm. that uh, you know and and Albert uh, again that uh, this has been a formidable running game. I mean, and and the offensive line has just been great. Um, you know, we, we've talked about Philip Smith and Cameron uh, Mason. Uh, we've talked about Asher McGriff. Um, Isaac Ramsey has just been sensational at center. And he's now he's playing defense too with Grady out. He's been playing outside linebacker, and he's he's I mean he's been getting five six tackles a game. I mean Isaac has just been uh, incredible. I I I didn't know <laughs> Isaac was capable of this, but it just it just speaks so well of Valley's ability to to develop players over time. Mm-hmm. You know I mean Wyatt Hart has been waiting patiently for his turn. He's a junior. I mean mm-hmm. he's been waiting, pa- but I mean he's he he was just terrific. So. We'll see how these guys do against a uh, Shatar team. I mean, again, Valley has, you know, bumped up their schedule so they'd be able to handle a team yeah. like Shatar. We'll see how they do. Again, Shatar's got, you know, again, they've had some great wins. I mean, the nine, you know, I think they beat Cathedral, who's, mm-hmm. you know, Shatar's won the most state championships, 16. Cathedral's won the second most, 14. Mm-hmm. So that's Shatar Cathedral games. That's a big deal every year, but they yeah. got that one. So yeah. we'll see how they do this time. I mean, uh, again, this is a Valley team that, Underestimating Valley has not gotten anybody anywhere these last three years. They just keep coming at you, yeah. and they keep impressing. And they have they have just developed such great depth. Yeah. Well, they do have a road win against number two West Lafayette under their belt for the year. So, right. uh, you know, we'll see what they can do. We'll be down there with uh, our Valley crew with Nate and McCartney, and uh, helping them out with that one since Rochester has the first round by, and we're really looking forward to going down there for that. Yeah, and, and um, the, the leadership that Valley has too with kids like Brock Durf and Landon Durkis on the yeah. defensive end. I'm really curious to see how Valley's defense does against Shatard's running game because Valley has basically shut down. They basically shut down every team's running attack except maybe Rochester had a little bit of success in that first quarter. Yeah, and then only seemed to get Valley mad. <laughs> yeah. It's just it's just crazy that top half of that bracket nine and zero you know Valley against nine and zero Chittard and then this the winner of that game will play the winner of seven and two Garen Catholic and nine and zero Peru right and one of Garen right one of Garen Catholic's losses were to Chittard right. in overtime right so yeah uh, yeah and the, the the good news is if Valley pulls off the upset they get they get the sectional semifinal at home yeah. And that's and that's not the only you know. There's three undefeated teams in the top half. There's an undefeated team in Hamilton Heights in the bottom half. Of that yeah, bracket. I mean, yeah. it's just crazy how good that section. Yeah, is. Hamilton Heights had a great win over West Lafayette last week. Yeah. So, 
It'll be an interesting one. We'll be down there. Our pregame will start, uh, you know, a little bit before seven. There, we'll have our our stream going about six thirty. We'll see uh, how much talking uh, you and Drew and McCartney want to do, but uh, we will be ready to go with the Tippecanoe Valley Vikings and the Bishop Chittard Trojans from Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. This will be a fun one. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the. Uh, Valley Cross Country Day. Of course, they were over at Manchester as well. How did uh, how did the uh, runners fare there for Valley? Well, Valley advanced one uh, one boy and two girls to the regional. The one boy is Christopher Marquez. He ran a personal best, eighteen forty one. That's a it's a really neat story about um, Christopher. He apparently during moratorium week, and I, I think I wrote about I wrote about this in my story. During moratorium week, he went in for his physical. You know, because you have to have a physical on file, and apparently the doctor said noticed something with his heart and like said uh, I'm concerned for you. you you need to stop running and he took three weeks off running and he had to visit a, spe- a heart a specialist a cardiologist mm-hmm. and the cardiologist I guess gave him the go gave him the go ahead uh, but but the bottom line is he had to take three weeks off of running and mm-hmm. so his conditioning really suffered during that time so uh, he, he sort of had to start back at square run square one but he slowly worked his way back. He's run better and better and better as the season progressed, and he finally got under 19 minutes a couple, I think, at New Haven, and then to get 18:41. What a great time for Christopher, and what a great story too to make regional. Mm-hmm. Um, he's put in a lot, a lot of time, and then had that health scare, and then um, has been running great again. So Good. I think everybody was just thrilled for him uh, that he was able to do that. And then on the girls' side, Chesney Miller, no surprise there. Chesney was eighth overall. She was first among. Uh, the 15 individuals on non-advancing teams. Uh, that was, you know, 1935 for Chesney. Another great time, uh, and she'll wear, she'll, wear, she'll wear gloves on Saturday. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, you know, uh, again, it was it was a fantastic, it was just a fantastic girls' race. I mean, you had Josefina Restrelli from Warsaw who won the race. She's going to IU. Huntington North had a fabulous freshman. Uh, Alice, I forget her name, Columbus, Columbia City had a terrific freshman. I mean, this was... It was a very, very good girls race. So for Chesney to finish eighth, it was very good. We'll see how she does. Uh, I mean, it, again, it, she might have to get under 1930. I don't know if she runs 1935 again. Will that be good enough? That's it's it's just hard to say. Uh, again, they're only remember that last year there were 16 regionals. This year there are five, mm-hmm. five regionals statewide. So it's going to be a packed race because hmm. you got 25 girls teams plus 75. 75 girls runners. So how do they divide that up north and south if there's only five? Uh, let's see. New Prairie, uh, New Haven, Brownsburg. There's one in Evansville, and there's one. So they don't really – Brownsburg would kind of be in the middle, of, and there's two maybe in the north and the south. So there's – Yeah. It's not as much – of course, with the, with running, it's different than the team sport, where you have a one team coming out of the south, one team coming out of the north. Right. So, so it's just basically just five five regionals. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. So yeah, and again, and again, top five teams of the regional will make state. So twenty five teams will make state as opposed to twenty four last year. Uh huh. Hmm. Well, that'd be interesting there. Good luck to the uh, runners from Valley. Uh, Volleyball-wise, the uh, We need to talk about Bailey Bussard as well. She's also going to regional. Okay. Bailey was fantastic. 21.47 I had her at. A personal best. I think first time she's been under 22 minutes. She was great. Mm-hmm. I mean, she she kept... I mean, obviously, it was hard It was hard for... Obviously, Restrelli was just... She was wide ahead of everybody, but she kept... She kept up that constant pace, and she was just great. I mean, she was, again, she has just really worked and worked and worked to get herself to, to regional, and I, I, I thrilled for her. Mm-hmm. So two Valley girls, Miller and Bussard. Yeah. yeah. What year is Bussard? Uh, junior. A junior. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Congratulations. The uh, volleyball team made it to the championship. It took a uh, five-setter against Bremen in the morning, but uh, another face-off with the – CGA Eagles, and it was the Eagles again. Right, and again, the comeback Lady Vikings, I mean, they were down two sets to one against Bremen in the morning mm-hmm. and came back to win, but the last two sets, 25-9, 15-5. Hmm. So they dominated, the, they, you know, they lost the third set, 26-28. Hmm. But in the last two sets, they turned it around. Yeah, they, boy, yeah. they turned it on. 
another fantastic day for Avery Wagner. 61 assists on the day in two matches. Wow. 42, including 42 against Bremen and 19 against CGA. Michaela Costello had 20 kills for the day. Uh, Erica Henderson and her final day as a, as a lady Viking volleyball player, 31 digs on the day. She was everywhere. She had plenty, 20 plus digs and 20 plus serves received against Bremen. Uh, but, uh, you know, Ava Smith had a really good day, but they're saying goodbye to those three key seniors. Mm-hmm. When you talk about Henderson, Colette Blackburn, and Ava Smith, they'll miss those three. But, yeah, again, they, they beat Bremen in five, but then against Culver Academy, they lost in three. Um, you know, Culver Academy has just had their number. They beat them in last year's sectional final. They beat them in three. They beat them in, th- or I think it was in four that last year, was it? I'd have to look it up again. But they beat them in three earlier this year in the regular season and beat them in three again mm-hmm. at the sectional final that's four straight sectional titles for culver academy yeah so that elusive sectional title for valley volleyball remains elusive they've still never won one yeah but they've come close i think they've uh, they've lost at least in the sectional final at least like five times in the last decade yeah they get they get close but valley uh 20 wins this year 20 and 12 mm-hmm. most wins since 2019 yeah so really good season for Valley Volleyball, but uh, unfortunately another loss in the sectional championship to CGA. Right, but Wagner yeah. will be back. Costello will be back. Uh, yeah, we mentioned Ava Egolf. She's graduating as well. She's been big out of the middle. But, again, uh, a lot of kids coming back. I mean, and Betty Shepard, I mean, she's just getting better and better and better. Mm-hmm. As a, and uh, so, I mean, the, Gabby Gonzalez, she's just a sophomore. And, I mean, she is just – Everywhere in that back row, mm-hmm. keeping balls off the floor. So, yeah, uh, again, good future. Good future for Valley Volleyball, even though they're they're graduating some significant players. Yep. All right, let's take a quick break here. We'll come back, and uh, we'll talk some Argus soccer in our next segment, along with some casting as well when we get back. When it comes to legal needs, you want to make sure that you have the best team in your corner. Here at Peterson, Wagoner, and Perkins, we strive to provide you with the highest quality legal and professional service. Whatever your needs are, from estate planning and trusts to appeals and guardianships, Peterson, Wagoner, and Perkins has the knowledge and experience to serve you now and in the future. Stop on by to In Your Hardware for all your home project needs. With a broad selection of garden supplies, tools, and paints featuring brands like Milwaukee, Diablo, and their newest paint line, Valspar, you can be sure that Inyards will supply you with the most top-rated equipment. And if you need something for a quick job, check out Inyards Rental Selection to get you going. Stop on in at 1619 Main Street, Rochester, or call 574-223-4920 to see how Inyards' friendly staff can help you. Pacesetters Real Estate knows that buying and selling properties can be a tough and complicated task. That's why we are here to provide you with our full service process where we walk with you every step of the way. Whether you're looking to buy a home or you're looking to sell, Pacesetters Real Estate is here for you. Call 574-223-5000 or visit us online at www.pacesettersre.net. At First Federal Savings Bank, you can bank on the go. With the First Federal Savings Bank mobile app, you can check account balances, transfer money, view account history, deposit your checks, and pay your bills. If you want your mobile banking done easy, download the First Federal Savings Bank mobile app today. The app is available for both Apple and Android phones and tablets. Just type in First Federal Savings Bank in the search bar and look for the white star with the green background. Hi, welcome back here. We are talking sports with Val for a Thursday afternoon this time. And talk a little bit of Argus soccer. We saw the match. We talked about it last week with the Dragons defeating Carroll. Moving on to the regional championship. They were down at Taylor. You got a chance to go down there against the Park Tudor. What's their? They're the Panthers. Panthers? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, you knew it was going to be a tough one. Park Tudor, very, very good defensive team, and, and yeah. they held Argus scoreless, scored two of their own, and they advanced. Yeah, Park Tudor won two to nothing. Argus had only one shot on goal the entire game. But, they, they you know, Todd Vanderweel always talks about build-up of play, and that's something that Argus really uh, thrives on. Well, <clears throat> in this game, Argus just couldn't build up anything. I mean, 
they couldn't get two or three passes in a row going. They couldn't they couldn't hit the fl- you know, and they, and they couldn't stretch the width of the field. Um, Park Tudor had a really good uh, two really good defenders and Molina. Well, Molina he was their really good defender. I mean, he was about six six two or six three, and he really moved well side to side, and he was just kind of physically imposing. And um, you could, they couldn't get the ball on the flanks. Then part, of, I think part of it too, the turf field was just, uh, in, it wasn't necessarily just the turf, but it was combining the turf with the drizzly weather. The ball just kind of skidded on the turf a lot, and it was just hard to kind of get a control, get control of the ball. The first goal that Park Tudor scored was on a very weird play. It was Jackson Kindig was trying to kind of clear the ball out of bounds after Boyd Paul had gone way out of the box. He thought Jackson well, it was like, well, if I just kick it out of bounds, I'll have to throw it in, and Boyd can get back in the net. The only problem is he kicked it off Boyd's leg. And it just deflected right to the Park Tudor player who just knocked it into an empty net. And that was just a sign that it wasn't going to be Argus's day. And the second goal was a beautiful goal by Park Tudor. It was a header off a corner kick where the kid just went way up in the air and hit a perfect header in the back corner of the net to beat Boyd Paul. So, yeah, uh, I think the better team won. It was a very physical game. Um, you know, there were Argus got three yellow cards, one player got. A red card and was ejected with so Argus played the last seven and a half eight minutes without played a ten and eleven mm-hmm. so that a, a tough task got even tougher. Yeah, but I think everybody everybody was you know uh, Ethan Petz had kind of a chance in the first half, but yeah I think I think the better team uh, there's no doubt the better team won but uh, I think everybody's you know even though Argus is graduating Sean Richard and. Uh, Frick, Jared Frick and uh, Eli uh, Luke, excuse me, Jared Frick, Luke Schaefer, and Jackson Kindig. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're graduating those four, but there are a lot of good players coming back. I yeah, mean, and this yeah. this team made a lot of big steps uh, in terms of how, uh, how they played um, as the season progressed this year. And I'm curious to see how they do next year. I, I think that, I think this I think they have a chance to be a very good team next year again. But again, the schedule will be really tough again next yeah, year. Yeah. But you saw kids like a little, little different though with the Hoosier North. Yeah, a little different. A little different. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure the non I'm sure the non conference schedule right. will remain tough. Right. Uh, they get, uh, but again, Kenyon Belden is just a freshman. He's got three more years left. It's going to be exciting to watch him. Mm-hmm. Uh, kids like uh, Ben Zom and Kyle Penn. Yeah. I mean, boy, Ben Zom took a huge leap this year. Yeah. Kyle Penn took a huge leap this year. Luke Stoltz will be back. Luke Stoltz will, yeah. you know, Luke Stoltz is. You they, know, they did everything in the, they did in the playoffs without Sawyer Crace as well. Right. Was, so, you, right. We'll see about how they're going to do that with Sawyer Crace and Boyd Paul because now they know they have to get two really good goalkeepers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and both Pets brothers will be back next year as yeah, well. So, yeah. really good returners. Yeah. So again, they'll be, uh, you know, they'll be in one A again next year. So again, I would imagine they'll be the favorite. I, in their sectional, we'll see. I guess we'll have to see how the sectional turns out, mm-hmm. how the sectional alignment turns out. But again, Argus will be formidable. But yeah, yeah. And once again, I mean, just a, a spectacular run for the Dragons in the postseason. You know, getting that sectional win again against North White that was great, and then that win at home in the regional semifinal against Carroll. I mean, that was a really, really good game. And yeah, you know, a lot of a lot of good things here. And of course, you know, we just continue to pray for Todd and, and hope that everything goes well for him. And yeah, hopefully he can be back with the team next year as well. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not the same without him. Yeah. So, but in, in the same vein, you know, uh, Damon and uh, you know uh, all the assistants, John, John Alcorn, and Andy Petz, Joe Kendig. Yeah, I mean, uh, they did a great Sp- job. Spencer Vanderweel yeah. was was there the last couple of games. Yeah. Uh, they did a great job. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, soccer knowledge in in those heads. <laughs> oh yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, in terms of, yeah, in terms of how they wanted to play, developing a style of play, and just developing the skill level of the players. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, t- Todd Vanderweel before he had his medical issue, he kept talking about this team is going to turn the corner. Yeah. He goes, I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen, and I think it. It happened. It happened without him, unfortunately, but it happened. Yeah, it did happen, and and a lot of good things to come for this team, mm-hmm. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So their season comes but to close. No more, no more Kindigs on the team. That is, yeah, that'd be weird. yeah. That's that's almost as uh, you know, like when the Dunlaps all graduated. That's 
kind of there's been a little kindig on the team for a decade, eight I think. years, I think. Yeah, at least yeah, yeah. yeah at least eight. Yeah, yeah, since uh, Ian. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, Park Tudor and uh, Bethany Christian, and which would be a very good semi-state game on yeah. at, at Kokomo on Saturday. They're in Kokomo. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Cast and football was wrapping their season up. They were at home for their last game of the year, taking on Knox and rough one there for the Comets. Final score was fifty to zero, and you know Knox is. I'm sure there's a lot of teams in the Hoosier North that aren't sad to see the, that big three A school leaving. Yeah, I talked with Coach Chris Ulrich after uh, the other night uh, on the phone, and I said, "Was there anything good that came out of that game?" And he said, "No." Mm. <laughs> It was twenty-two to nothing after one quarter. It was it was actually fifty to nothing at halftime. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just not. You know, they they had some ideas about things they wanted to do, but they just didn't play very well. And yeah, so I think I think they've quickly tried to turn the page here. Yeah. Uh, well, they go to uh, Monon tomorrow night to take on the nine and zero North White Vikings, but. You know they played them back in uh, late September, and it was fourteen to six. Can yeah. they do it again? Can they can they win this game? North White's number seven on the poll. Who who would have thought North White would go nine and zero? Oh? I had I didn't know that. I mean I knew no. that they had gotten better. Yeah, and I expected a winning record. I did not expect nine and zero, oh, and they capped it off with a fantastic win over West Central, twenty to eighteen on Friday night, and what was basically the Midwest Conference Championship game right, because right. West Central was also four and zero in the conference. Um, this North White team revolves around three kids: Eli Quaysbarth, C.J. Hunt, and Cade DeBoard. Um, Quaysbarth's their quarterback. Uh, Hunt's their fullback. DeBoard is their kind of their speed, speedy halfback, and they're, they're three leading tacklers on defense as well. So mm-hmm. I mean, those three guys carry this team. Mm-hmm. Quaysbarth, Caston held them down when they played him earlier. He had, he had like like 108 yards rushing. But the thing is, he averages over 200 yards rushing per game. I mean, he he's a quarterback. He averages. He averages. He wow. carry, he, he had a game with 340 earlier this year. I mean, he <laughs> he is a quarterback who he is a running quarterback. I mean, he uh-huh. he is a quarterback who calls his own number. A lot of the time, and then Hunt, he's kind of their sledgehammer. I mean, he's yeah. if Quaysbarth's their quick guy and DeBoard their speed guy, well, Hunt's their he's just going to hammer you up the middle. Yeah. So, I mean, those are the three guys you got to stop. Um, it's worth noting that West Central outrushed North White last week, and West Central outpassed North White last week, but they lost the game. Hmm. I mean, it came down to a two-point conversion at the end, and North White hung on twenty to eighteen. So this is a North again. North White's had a fantastic season but this is a winnable game for Caston I believe given the competition that they played seven of what Caston's nine opponents during the regular season finished with winning records mm-hmm. the only two that didn't were Winnemac and Caston mm-hmm. so Culver Winnemac excuse me Winnemac and Culver yeah. were the two yeah. of course they got and of course they beat Culver so right. again Caston has seen plenty of plenty of tough competition this year uh you know we'll see how we'll see how they do again uh talk with Coach Chris Ulrich the other night, he said North White, they're big on the lines offensively and, and defensively. So we'll see, how, you know, again, we'll see how this the this young cat, again, cats has got a, kind of a mixture of youth and experience on the line, but guys like Pete Duvall and Levi Martin, how well do they handle it on the line? Are they able to physically handle themselves against North White? Because the key for North White is their defensive line wants to occupy your offensive line so their linebackers can get a bunch of tackles. Yeah. And if they do somehow pull out the win against North White, they would have a terribly tough Week 2 opponent coming into the crater. Right, probably. almost almost certainly they'd have to face Carroll at, yeah. Car- at Carroll. At Carroll. It would be at, at Carroll, Carroll, and Carroll's ranked number 3 in their 9-0 and as well. So <laughs> it's possible Kasson would get two undefeated teams right off the bat. On, uh, on the road. Right, uh, Carroll, right. Tri-County, they have their own ideas. Tri-County's hosting Carroll tomorrow night, so mm-hmm. if, it is, if Tri-County somehow pulls off the upset, and I wouldn't I would say there's a severe underdog, but yeah. if it were Tri County and Caston in the second round, it would be at Caston. Yeah, that sectional all of a sudden got pretty good this year. It did. Yeah, it West did. Central and uh, North White and Carroll. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it'd be interesting. We'll see how they do. It'll be uh, Caston at North White tomorrow night for round one of sectional. Let's see what that's forty three, right? Sectional forty three. Yep. yep. Uh, tell us about the Caston cross country team. They were at Logan Sport on Saturday for their sectional action. Well, one boy advanced, and that was Edison Byram. No big surprise there. Edison ran 18 minutes flat uh, and advanced. Uh, so I think he was, uh, and that was a, just a tough. It was a tough sectional. I mean, the Pioneer boys, who we've talked about all year, they finished fifth. I mean, they 
they may they may not, but there was plenty to spare between the fifth and sixth place teams. I don't think Pioneer was ever really threatened, but yeah, uh, Edison anyway. Edison Byron made it, and then for the cast and girls, uh, they had put three girls into the three. regional. Uh, Camilla Hernandez Rios, excuse me, Alexa Lau was the, the number one. We we talked about this team. They they're they have these three sophomores who have been kind of interchangeable all year. One time Alexa Lau is, one time Camilla Hernandez Rios is the front runner, so one time Jaded Jaded Aguilar is the front runner. Well, they, all three of them made it, mm -hmm. uh, and all were. I think uh, Alexa was in the twenty three forties. Camilla was like right behind her, like couple seconds behind her and then uh, 20, 24 27 for Jada Aguilar so that was great. great I mean I think I think it's going to be a first time regional experience for all three I think mm -hmm. so that's uh, yeah that, that's just a fantastic accomplishment for those three and they get to go down to Brownsburg now so that uh, that should be interesting as well yeah it'll be a very tough regional sure. I mean I would imagine if you're going to advance you're going to have to get at least under 21 and probably under 20 yeah to have a chance to even in that top 15. So what about Edison down there, do you think? And then the, and the boy, yeah, Edison, we'll see. But, again, he's probably going to have to run run under 17.30 to even have a chance. He ran 18 minutes at Logansport. Logansport's a slow course, I think. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's 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 tough. I mean, it's got a lot of woods, and, yeah, it's... it's Thick grass, I think. 16.23 yeah. was the, uh, was the uh, winning time mm -hmm. in the boys' race at Logansport compared to 15.54 at Manchester, mm -hmm. just as a point of comparison. So yeah. I think it's, it's, it's not the fast course. So I, again, I don't know much about Brownsburg's course, so we'll right. see We'll see how they do. But, yeah, um, again, Edison's been the front runner on that casting team all year. Yeah. And it continued again. Yeah. So good luck to them as they travel down to Brownsburg on Saturday morning for regional action. Casting volleyball, you know, we talked about it. Boy, just a rough sectional and, and a heck of a – First round game as they had to take on the host number four Southwood, and unfortunately for the Comets, they lost in straight sets. Yeah, and the thing, all right, Southwood is just, they're just so they just don't make mistakes. They don't beat themselves at all, and they just keep everything off the floor. And then they've got the you know they've got the two terrific freshmen and Ramey and Pershing, and then they've got uh, you know a really good player in Grace Drake, who's I mean she seems like she's been there forever. She's only a junior. I mean she's. Mm -hmm. She's kind of, you know, we've talked about Pioneers, Mackenzie Rogers. Drake does a lot of things for Southwood that Rogers does for she Pioneer. She was big in that win against Pioneer when, when they, that, that was her freshman yeah, year, wasn't it? Yeah, she can do a little bit of everything yeah. in a volleyball court. She mm -hmm. can set, she can hit, she can dig, she's, uh, you know, she can pass. She she can do her, and she I think she had 12 kills in that casting match. But, yeah, I mean, cast, you know, casting, if they had somehow pulled out that second set, they Again, maybe they would have given themselves a chance, but again, Southwood they they found a way to win that second set, and that was twenty five nine in the third set. So, yeah. Keston yeah. doesn't lose many sets twenty five nine. You're no. going to be pretty good to beat them. Macy Hinderleiter had five kills, uh, sixteen digs, and twenty three serves received for Addison Zimpleman. Addison, you know, I mean, we've talked about Addison as a softball player so much. Her improvement as a volleyball player was so impressive to me because mm -hmm. she really had to play, be like a six rotation player this year. We, yeah. we we talked about her as a back row player. She hit a lot more this year than she mm -hmm. had in, in previous years, and then continued to be a, just a stud in the back row. But you now they graduate Hinderleiter, they graduate Zimpleman, they graduate Isabel Scales, of course, they graduate Annie Harsh, and of course they graduate Alexa Finke, who Finke. is one mm -hmm. of the a fantastic middle hitter, yeah. middle blocker for that team. It's going to be a different looking cast in the team. But you know, um, Natalie Warner came on, and she got a lot of bit, a lot of playing time on Saturday, and is. You know, she's just a freshman, and there's just a lot of potential there. Yeah. And you got McKenna Middleton back at setter next year, so, uh, it, yeah. I mean, we'll we'll see what their team looks like, but I mean, they've they're building depth. Yeah, two two really good years. Both uh, last two years, they've won well over 20 games, and you know, just unfortunately, it's just a, a brutal sectional for them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 24 and eight, but yeah, and uh, I mean, Northfield. I'm sure Northfield would commiserate with them because right. Northfield had a great year too, and they lost. They lost in three in the sectional final to Southwood, mm -hmm. and I mean that was twenty-five-five in the third set. I can't imagine anybody beating Northfield twenty-five-five in any set. Yeah, that's what happened. So and Southwood's going to play, I think, I believe Daleville in the regional yeah. semifinal, and that's at Southwood. They host the they host it there again. So, yeah, you know they get that home field advantage, home court advantage, I guess, in, yeah. uh, in the regional as well. So, yeah, they call it the castle yeah. at Southwood. Yeah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. The Knights. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
All right. Anything else casting wise you want to talk about here before we take a break? Uh, I think that's that's it. Yeah. I mean, we've got. I just I just love the the pictures of the kids doing well in the weight room. Yeah. That has been a it's been on social media if you've been looking for it. Well, you know, um, I think Gina Hurlmeyer was really pushing that when she was the AD at Valley, and then when she got the AD job at uh, Caston, she got that going there as well. And mm-hmm. you know, it's it's paid off, especially on the girls' side. Yeah, I mean, they're <laughs> you know, last year basketball season, we'll see again this year probably as well. But uh, yeah, they are definitely a lot stronger. Yeah, Brandon Kinzer has been involved in a lot yeah. of the day to day stuff with yeah. that in the weight room as yeah. well. So a great program there for the comments. So let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk some Culver and Pioneer here on Talking Sports with Val. Criskins Pools and Spas is your local contractor for all your pool and hot tub installation needs. With a wide selection to choose from, Criskins is sure to hook you up with exactly what you need, no matter what your budget is. To learn more about our services, visit CriskinsPoolsAndSpas.com Call 574-857-3100 or stop on by at 7448 Liberty Avenue in Fulton to see how Criskins can help you. Here we go, Billy. Swing hard. As your local agent, I know you. I know every Saturday your son Billy plays Little League. We sponsor his team. And we know you love parking way too close to the field. That's why we tailor a unique policy for you and your car. Because sometimes, something from out of left field can literally come from out of left field. That's simple human sense. Ask the Jennings Insurance Agency in Argus and Rochester if auto owners make sense for you. Looking for an easy way to provide custom branded products for your business, school, sports team, or fundraising event? Let the Winning Edge set up a customized web store that features branded products tailored to your business, school, church, or charitable cause. With a wide variety of customizable apparel, sports accessories, office accessories, and custom tumblers, the Winning Edge is sure to provide you with the best style that suits you. Find your edge by calling 574-223-6090 or going to our website, thewinningedgeathletics.com, and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Hello, sir. How can I help you today? I'm looking for a special gift. We have no tolerance for tomfoolery today. What do you mean, tomfoolery? What I said was, we have a nice selection of jewelry today. May I suggest that you give my friends at Affordable Hearing a call? Affordable Hearing offers hearing testing and unique solutions for everybody. We guarantee the lowest prices in the area and now have offices in Rochester and Logansport to serve you better. Call to book an appointment today. Welcome back here, talking sports with Val on a Thursday afternoon. And, oh, the Culver Cavaliers, you know, we, we knew that it was going to be a rough year with the graduation losses they had last year. And, uh, unfortunately, they end the season 0-9 as they were on the road at LaVille. And Lancers take care of business in the last meeting ever between the Lancers and the Cavaliers, 52-0 final score. And, Culver's got another date with South Central at South Central yeah. coming up uh, tomorrow night, and you know they lost the first game, forty-four to twenty-two. You know what's what's it going to take here for Coach Faust and the Cavaliers to get a win? Yeah, I talked with Col- Culver coach Austin Faust earlier in the week. He was actually pretty happy with the way they they, they started off the game. I think they forced a three and out. They it was it was a tight game, about twenty. To, I think it was only like twenty to nothing at halftime, but Laville wound up winning fifty-two to nothing. I think they just kind of wore down Culver in the second half. Um, you know, now they, and again, that was a LaVille team that they thought they had something to play for because the, if they had won and Knox had lost at cast and they would have tied for a conference title. So they knew LaVille wasn't going to take it easy on them, mm-hmm. but, um, yeah, uh, again, yeah, again, no, Knox and LaVille were the two best teams in the conference this year and they'll be out of the conference next year. So mm-hmm. the, so as for uh, Culver, you know, so it'll be a different looking conference next year football wise, but as for the current right now 2023 Cavaliers you know they play South Central in Union Mills on Friday night um we we believe that Zach Hanshar their quarterback is out and I think he's a three-year starter at quarterback he's um due to uh, injury and we believe that their running back Aaron Hogan is out as well and Hogan had a huge game against Culver the first time so mm-hmm. uh it is a depleted South Central team but of course Culver is not going to be feel too much sympathy for them because Culver's been dealing with a lot of injuries themselves, right. especially on the line. Uh, again, 
if Culver can just if Culver can stand, can hold them hold up to the physicality of South Central's line play, I think that that would be key. I don't think this is an explosive South Central team, especially without Hanchar and Hogan. They've only scored 16 points their last two weeks combined. But I'm not again. Can can Culver get their offense going? They might need some big plays. Again, Tony uh, Tony Summers has been out with his uh, with an injury as well, and he's has provided some speed to the backfield. So again, uh, this one's kind of a hard one to call. I guess South Central's the favorite because they're at home. Uh, but I, again, I think the. Key, the key is if Culver can get some confidence going on the defensive end. Mm-hmm. If they can get a stop or two or get a tur- even a t- turnover and get some good field position, uh, that would be their best chance in this game. Yeah, they've they've been able to put some points on the board, but trying to uh, stop the other the opponent from putting points on the board has been their bugaboo this year for sure. Yeah, they've they've really struggled on the defensive side of things and. You get a banged up South Central team in here. You get some confidence going, and you know if you can make it to halftime and it's a close game, I think you're gonna you know feel pretty good about things. Yeah. And you know the it's not a terribly tough sectional, but you, you know it, it's not an easy sectional either. But you know there are some wins to be had in that possibly. Right. Winner of that game will play the winner of the Triton North Newton game. Triton is going to be heavily, 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 heavily favored yeah. in that game. North Newton is winless. Triton's ranked in the top ten in one A. That yeah, Triton probably the the favorite of that sectional, but yeah, I think you could yeah, I think you could I think you could say that yeah. I mean Triton with the way they the way they played against Winnemac last week to beat a two A team on the road yeah yeah. So good luck to the Cavaliers as they look for their first win of the season here as they start postseason play at South Central on Friday evening. Um, any cross country notes for Culver from sectionals? Um, no, um, there was um, one girl runner. I think Savannah was it Savannah Harrington who ran, and then uh, one boy runner, Adam Peterson. I think we talked about Adam you, doing cross country and uh, soccer at the same time, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, ne- neither of them advanced. Neither so. of them advanced. Okay, um, Pioneer. It's kind of a uh, Interesting last two weeks of the or last week of the season, first week of the uh, tournament as they hosted North Judson on Friday for their final game of the year, and then they will be turning around and going to Liberty Field in North Judson tomorrow night for first round of the uh, tournament. Didn't go really well for Pioneer in that uh, final game of the season, losing thirty-three to twelve to the Blue Jays. Right, and it was only nineteen to twelve at halftime, but it just seemed like once the weather get, when the, once the weather went from bad to worse, North Judson. I mean, and you put the ball in just Brock Benson's hands. I mean, he is just he is not fun to tackle. I mean, he is just a beast of a fullback. But you look at you look at Pioneer. I mean, here's what they can take out of this game. They had two hundred nine yards rushing on six point three yards carry. I mean, they ran the ball against a North Judson defense that's known for their their defense. And known for and known for their ability to stop the run, mm-hmm. you know, Ryland Toloza had 112 yards rushing. Caden Hill had some success on the ground. Um, uh, you know, Shiloh Ryan had a that touchdown run Shiloh Ryan had late in the first half. That was a thing of beauty. Where he just kind of spun off. It, it was I, I think I don't know if it was it was like the 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 North Judson kid thought he had Shiloh, but Shiloh kind of escaped. I don't know if he was just kind of a wet jersey or something, but he escaped and. It was an awesome run down the sideline for a touchdown, uh, but they just weren't able to get things going offensively in the second half, and the problem was four turnovers. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and Pioneers had problems with turnovers all year. I mean, two fumbles and two interceptions, and they didn't complete a pass all game. Mm-hmm. So they went over the two quarterbacks, Ryan and, and Michael Rands did play a little bit, yeah. but th- those two quarterbacks went 0 for 5 with two interceptions. The, Again, they don't need to have a spectacular passing attack, but just enough to keep the the other opposing team's defense honest. Yeah. Because you know Guffey can can be a threat in the pa- passing game, and so uh, we'll see. Can get, but again, I I don't think this is just an impossible task for Pioneer to win at North Judson. I, yeah. This is not the best North, North Judson team they've had, but they're going to have to. I mean, eliminate the mistakes. If I mean. Yeah, you can't turn the ball over against uh, Judson and and be successful. How how's the Panthers' health? I know Rands played a little bit, but was not able to finish the game. Is he going to be able to play? And Toloza, I, I would assume, is is back. Yeah, he and, had, he had and, seventeen carries the other night. Yeah, yeah, he's back and looking pretty good. Yeah, uh, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think Rands is just the big question mark at yeah. the, is the or the biggest question mark at this point. But again, uh, Pioneer has so many young kids on the line, and they and they they've been banged up on the line, both mm-hmm. offensive and defensive lines all year. That I mean, they they've really had to make adjustments over the course, you know. Uh, uh, Schnurple, uh, Tyler Schnurple's been banged up at time, for example. Uh, uh, so if they can be healthy, I mean, uh, just being healthy on the line, that, that, that'll help out a lot. Yeah. Eli Guffey has been a tackling machine. I think he had 16 tackles against North Judson. He's been great. And Caden Hill, is he's just a, he's one of the best safeties in our area. Yeah. Not, like you said, not an impossible task. They, they can get this done. And, and whoever wins this game is going to have a pretty good opportunity to make it into the championship because – the other two teams there that are playing that would uh, the winner of the other two Bowman uh, Academy and South Newton yeah, yeah that's, doesn't, uh, doesn't appear to be a, a you know one of the better teams in the sectional right right whoever right and I believe Pioneer would be at home Pioneer beats Juts and they'd be at home for that se- right. semifinal game no matter who the opponent is yeah so get back to the pit there so again yeah but uh, yeah. I, I wanted to give a shout out to Eli Guffey. He's he's had a great year. I mean, mm-hmm. he, boy, he, he's such a bright future for a sophomore. He doesn't he doesn't look like a sophomore. And Shiloh Ryan is going to have a really good career too before it's said done. Yeah, he's just a freshman playing quarterback, and just fill you know filling in. I don't know how much experience he's had, but uh, a lot of a lot of really young kids in that Pioneer team. Obviously, Toloza and and Caden Hill and you know a few seniors, but not a huge senior class for Pioneer. And and right. have a lot of young players that have played big time minutes for them this year yeah the, the burns kid at right tackle yeah. yeah yeah so so a lot of good things to come see what they can do here they'll yeah. be on the road that'll be i believe what a 7 30 start 7 30 start central. yeah yeah 7 30 eastern so right uh, the culver south central game is also 7 30 yeah. yeah so pioneer and judson at north liberty or at liberty field in north judson trying to combine them together but both teams five and four going into this one, so yeah. we'll see. Watch out for Cole Wilcox of North Judson, 227 yards rushing last week. If Benson's their hammer, yeah. then Wilcox is their speed on their offense. They're going to try and get him out on the perimeter. Yeah. All right, let's take a quick break here. We'll come back. We'll talk some uh, Panthers volleyball here as we uh, move into our next segment. Mike Anderson in Rochester is here to set you up with a new set of wheels. From coming on the lot to driving off in your new dream car, Mike Anderson strives to give you the smoothest dealership experience. Not only that, but Mike Anderson in Rochester is here to lend a hand with their service center to keep your ride running. Stop on in for a test drive or call today at 574-223-2711 to see how Mike Anderson in Rochester can steer you in the right direction. Since 1974, Steve Moore Agency has provided the City of Rochester with customized insurance solutions that will fit your needs. With a variety of coverage policies for business, home, auto, life, and more, Steve Moore Agency is sure to cover all your insurance needs. Call now at 574-223-3010 or stop on in at 602 East 9th Street to see what Brody Moore at Steve Moore Agency can do for you. At Webb's Family Pharmacy, we strive to provide our community with a better alternative. We respect the many choices our patients have when it comes to health care needs. When they choose us, we go above and beyond to offer them personalized service and care that will consistently remind them of why we are a superior choice to other pharmacies. Pharmacy care should be proactive when possible. It should be customized to patient needs. It should strive for better health outcomes. It should help manage costs. At Webb's Family Pharmacy, our mission is to provide the pharmacy care you deserve. Fulton County REMC is proud to offer the Operation Roundup Charitable Giving Program. Through Operation Roundup, Fulton County REMC is able to give to local organizations and communities by simply rounding up your monthly bill and donating the change. Since its inception, Operation Roundup has generated over $50 million in charitable donations throughout 260 electric cooperatives. To learn more about this great program, visit www.fultoncountyremc.com or call in at 574-223-3156. Hi, welcome back here. We are talking sports with Val, and let's talk a little Pioneer Volleyball, Winnemac Volleyball also here in this segment as the Panthers hosting the sectional. And, you know, the home cooking for the Pioneer Panthers has been pretty successful. Last time they hosted the uh, the sectional back in 2020, they won it, and uh, they were hosting again. And 
start off here in our first semifinal round match of the day and Pioneer and Winnemac taking on for a chance to go to the championship round. Kind of as expected, I you know Pioneer was pretty well in control early on and you know Winnemac rough year for for coach Caston, you know, just the two wins on the season. Mm -hmm. They had that early season or that early win in their tournament and then uh, defeated Rod or Argus in uh late in the season but uh you know pioneer was was on point early and often in this one right and this was just a serving clinic by argus by excuse me by pioneer against winnemac in this match uh winnemac had passing problems for much of the match first set was 25 7 pioneer Nice crowd on hand uh, all day there at Pioneer, and you know, Winnemac had that first round by, so they were trying to compete with a, a Pioneer team that had beaten them, you know, in straight sets in the regular season conference matchup there, twenty-five five, and in set number mm -hmm. two, you know, Pioneer and uh, well in control of that one. Want to give a shout out to the uh, Pioneer TV crew. Uh, you know they had a late night on Friday night with the football game, and of course the weather was pretty crummy as well. And came back early Saturday morning and did a really good job. Mm -hmm. Three matches uh, throughout the day there, and they did a really good job with the. You know we threw a couple cameras in. You can see obviously the inline camera on both sides and. Some nice looks. Pioneer would win against the Warriors yeah. three sets to zero. Yeah, 25-7, 25-5, 25-9, I think it was. So so that was Pioneer's 21st win in the season that improved them to 21-13. and 13. Uh, The second semifinal was the North Miami Warriors who had advanced yeah. defeating Rochester in the quarterfinal, and they were taking on the defending sectional champion Wabash Apaches. And... Wabash would win in four sets. Mm -hmm. Took them four sets, but uh, so that would set up the rematch of uh, Wabash and Pioneer. Those two teams met in the semifinal round last mm -hmm. year, with Wabash winning, and of course Wabash would go on to win the sectional. And Pioneer wanted to uh, have some say in in who was getting out of their right sectional. And Right, I talked with the Pioneer kids afterwards, and they just talked a lot about energy. We needed to come out with energy and, and you know, continue to encourage, um, you know, even if you, you know, even if you shank a ball, even if you miss a ball, even if you lose a point, keep up the energy. They talked about that a lot, and it just seemed like, you know, Pioneer was able to establish their middles early in the game, and once they establish their middles, then they kind of they can play the width of the court a little bit more, and they become very, very difficult to defend. And and you can talk about it, but actually, you know, executing energy is is a little bit harder than yeah. you know saying you're going to do it. But boy, they really did. I mean, everybody on the floor was just they were into it early, and you know they they were all making the shots as well. Yeah, and like uh, they talked about you know appreciating what your uh, appreciating what your teammates do for you. If you had a kill, appreciate the girl who got the dig and got the set to get you the ball where you got the kill. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, it's just hard to pick a standout in this. I mean, you know, Mackenzie Rogers, I think we we talked about that one play where, we, where she did just about everything. Mm -hmm. I think she had, like, a, about a block, a dig, a a, an ass a, a set, and a, I think she wound up with a kill. Yeah. But uh, that was the way the second set ended. Pioneer won with 25-18, 25-11. Yeah. They dominated the second set, and then this is... Match point. I mean, I think they were up sixteen to four at one point in the third set. So it got a little, got a little sloppy toward the toward the end. But uh, this is going to end on a kill by Brooklyn Borges, and she's going to tuck this one 
from the middle just inside the left sideline. And it's so good to see her back in, mm -hmm. in, you know, her best form. Yeah. I mean, she she has worked really hard to get back from that knee injury. And, right. you know, congratulations to the Panthers. They're going to advance to uh, Rochester on Saturday. And yeah. In my, in my article about the match, I talked a lot about Pioneer's system. Because mm -hmm. it, it's a three-setter, three-middle system, and they just – that they say that confuses their opponent. I, there was even a, I didn't get a chance to talk to uh, uh, Mackenzie. I, I, I talked to Mackenzie Rogers on Thursday night after the Lewis Cass match, mm -hmm. and she talked a little bit about that. I didn't get a chance to throw that quote in my article, but yeah, she's she says like sometimes opponents are you can you can she can hear them across the other side of the net talking like where's the where's it coming from where's the set coming from because mm -hmm. the set could be coming from the, either the back row or the front row. Pioneers gets their middles going. They get their they get their opposite going. It's it's an it's an interesting style, but it, it definitely works for them. I've never seen anything like it before, really. Yeah, it's hard to get them out of system because there's so much uh, variety that they can do with their system. Right. I yeah. mean, to be able to run that system, you have to have a very versatile team where players are multi have skill are skilled in multiple areas, mm -hmm. and that's what they are with Rogers with Grigsby. Mm -hmm. Uh, and with uh, Nye, Kirsten, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Kirsten was, she was especially. She, I mean, obviously they all serve well, but Kirsten's serve was especially good. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I think she had five aces in that Wabash match. Yeah, she is. She is definitely one of the top servers in the state. And uh, yeah, you know, she's she's done really well. Yeah, and I talked with Adeline Kripe afterwards. I said, you know, you're really good in tip coverage. Is that? I mean, like, what part? Like, what percentage of your job is that? And she goes a hundred percent. She goes, if I screw that up, I'm, I can't, I'm not yeah. helpful to the team. She goes, right. yeah, she's she's at a hundred percent. So, yeah. and I mean, she served well. Well, she always serves well. And mm -hmm. but I mean, I thought she was especially sharp the other night. I mean, Pioneer, you know, when they when they don't let the ball hit the floor in the back row, that's they're going to be really really good. And you know, there was I think there was some concern with, uh, uh, you know, due to due to the injuries. But I I mean, I think they're you know I, I think they're they're making do. Yeah, well, a lot of uh, Lois Layer has seen some time. Yeah, Lois yeah. Layer is is uh, in that rotation there in that back row. She does a really good job as well. And yeah. you know, it, it's going to be a, Emma Sells has been injured. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be a it's going to be a really interesting regional. You got some some really good teams. We 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 kind of figured Busco would be there. They're going to be playing Ileana Christian in that first game. Busco twenty nine and five. Ileana Christian, a little bit of a surprise. We kind of thought it would be Andrean, but they defeated Andrean. And uh, so it'll be Ileana Christian and Busco in, in the semifinal in the first one. Uh, Ileana Christian, 22 and 10, but you can't uh, you can't overlook them. as I haven't seen their exact schedule, but I'm sure they played a bunch of 3A and 4A yeah, teams. Yeah, and, and if you can knock off Andrean, uh -huh. you're going to get instant respect. Yeah, yeah. So... That's going to be an interesting one, and then of course South Central at thirty-two and zero, taking on twenty-two and thirteen Pioneer at twelve thirty. Tatum Wade, she has just been incredible for South Central. They played. They played the last Monday of the regular season. Pioneer uh, had an opportunity, but South Central came back and won that one in five. Right. So. How how do you get the block going up against Tatum Wade? How do you try and stop her? Yeah. Because she has been just a killing machine. And then, you know, they've got the two Welsh sisters um, who have been great. And, of course, their mom is the head coach. Mm -hmm. So 32-0 uh, and 0 is 32-0. and 0. Uh, But I, I would venture to say if Pioneer plays the way they did Saturday evening, they're going to be a hard one to get out to. Right, especially because their system is so unique. And mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure South, South Central has seen anything like what Pioneer does. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, it was it was a uh, you know that was a tough loss when they played earlier because I mean Pioneer was up two sets to one and South mm -hmm. Central came back to win in five. Uh, that I think that's the only five set match South Central has played all year. Yeah, I mean they've been that dominant. Yeah, and I think was it the first the first set that South Central won? It was it was looking like it was Pioneer going to get that one and and then South Central came back and won. Yeah, set one and then then Pioneer won set two and three and mm -hmm. and then. Uh, South Central was able to get four and five, so yeah. it was it was a tough match. I mean, it looked like it might be the first loss of the season for South Central, and they were able to come back and win it in five. So yeah, 
the rematch is going to be interesting. Yeah, so. yeah, because uh, because the teams now know a lot about each other. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see. I was very impressed at uh, the way Pioneer played though on Saturday. Yeah, very impressed. They when they have everybody firing all, on all cylinders, they are a very good team. And thirteen losses. You look at who they lost to. That was a who's who of volleyball in the state of Indiana. Right. So. Right. Everybody from Linton Stockton to Andrean LCC to to Benton Central, who's a top five team in three A, won a sectional championship. Yeah, West Lafayette. West Lafayette. South Central. Yeah. yeah. So we'll see. It'll be an interesting day. Fort Wayne Blackhawk. Yeah. 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 It'll be an interesting day for sure. Ten thirty a.m. Busco Ileana Christian, followed by South Central Pioneer at twelve thirty. The championship. We'll be at 7 p.m. We'll have all those games for you on IHSA TV. Yeah. And the other big story in 2A in the other regional in the north, uh, Adams Central upset South Adams. Did they? To win their sectional. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pioneer cross country. We talked a little bit about it. The boys were able to finish yeah. in fifth place. The boys, boys were fifth at the, at the Logansport sectional. The girls were seventh. Uh, so the boys team advances. Uh, you know what? Uh, again, great time for uh, Leighton Dot. 1702. Uh, Carson Meyer was kind of right, but right behind him again. 1702 in a pretty slow course. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think uh, um, Carson Meyer was thinking the 17. I think I want, you know he was a little bit behind. Uh, and then the two freshmen are really coming on, and Bodich and Nance. Again, they were like 1826 and 1831. Jackson Baker a little off by his standards, 1855. Uh, but again, I, I would imagine though I'm curious to, to see if they do better at Brownsburg. Mm-hmm. Again, there'll be more there'll be more traffic at Brownsburg. I mean, it'll 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 seem like a semi-state because of the traffic, mm-hmm. just the foot traffic. But how will they? How will the times be? Because mm-hmm. uh, I think I think Brownsburg might be a faster course. I'm I'm curious to see if it is. Yeah. Uh, but uh, again, it was a, it was a good race. It was a really good race. McConaughey. Uh, one, there were a lot of, and even the even the, the team, like even if you didn't have a great team, everybody had w- at least one really good runner. I know Clinton Prairie had a really good runner. Um, Eastern had a really good runner. Uh, Obadiah Green, you know, Carol's all Carol's always really solid. That was a man. They they put together a tough section of Logansport. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and as for the girls, Violet Montgomery made it, and Ellie Hines made it too. That uh, we knew Violet. That's not a big surprise. Twenty thirty four, mm-hmm. yeah, on a pretty slow course. You know, I, I we'll see. You know, Violet ran what nineteen thirty seven at conference. You know, again, will it take something in the nineteen thirties to get out of regional and get to state? We'll see about that. And then Ellie Hines, that was a, that was a great story. Mm-hmm. Avery has to be just missed the top fifteen individuals and not advancing teams make it, and Avery was sixteenth. Oh, darn, yeah. 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 So some some really good results, and like we said, they will be down at Brownsburg on Saturday for a regional, and no semi-state. So they, you know, if if they advance, they go right to the state. Yeah, what a what a year Coach Williams and his guys have had. Uh, you know, you'd have I'm re- I'm really uh, optimistic for Layton. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, you know, again 1702, and again that was after he ran. What in the fifty? Did he run in the fifteens at conference? I know he was. It was sensational at conference, mm-hmm. but again, I, I, again, I, I just don't know enough about the Brownsburg course to know what to what expect. To but I mean, I think Layton, he's as good as he was last year when he won the regional. At, it was a different looking regional at Culver Cam, on a different course at Culver Cam, But he's that much better this year. Mm-hmm. So even if the team can't quite make it, I think Layton's got a shot. Yeah, but that should be a very, very difficult regional. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be crazy down there. It's going to have a lot of Indy area runners and you know, big schools. Yeah. Yeah, so good luck to uh, all of the Panthers on uh, the regional there at Brownsburg. Winnemac Warriors, let's talk a little Winnemac football. Is, uh, you know, they came into Friday night's game with uh, a three-game winning streak on the line, and unfortunately, um, you know, a really good Triton team. And, yeah. Triton's just had a really good year. Right. I mean, right. Triton was coming off a loss to Knox the previous week, and they were probably wanting to get back on, get back on their groove. Mm-hmm. And that game was it was over early. I mean, it was twenty-eight to nothing after the first quarter, and you're just not going to overcome that against a good team. 
Winnemac again had problems with fumbling. I mean, they lost five fumbles against Caston. Were able to win that game the previous week. This time they lose three fumbles. Can't get away with that against a team like Triton, including two fumbles in the first quarter that led to touchdowns. Yeah. And then Triton had those two big plays, the one long pass play to uh, 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 and the, the, there was one long, it was like a 47-yard running play and a 49-yard passing play. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Shively's just, he's capable of making plays. But it was 28 nothing after the first quarter, and it was just, it was just a rough night. I wanted to give a shout-out to Addison Allen, though. 12 carries for 100 yards and a, and a 60. 60 plus yard touchdown run in the second quarter. Yeah. To account for winning max points. Remember, they were without Jaden Jones, who was out due to concussion. So, really, more of a, the responsibility in the running game fell on Addison Allen's shoulders mm-hmm. to go along with Maddox Businski against a good defense in Triton. So, Winnemac goes on the road for their first week of sectional play again. They're taking on LCC. So, which means, and LCC means. Mason Meister, 34 carries for 218 yards and three touchdowns last week in the win at Western. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, LCC ran it 36 times, and they passed it 12 times against Western. That's a 2A beating a 4A. Mm-hmm. Uh, I talked with Josh Burgess earlier this week. He goes, that might have, the weather might have had a lot to do with that. There, there's still a spread, don't, you know, don't get anybody wrong. There's still a spread team, but mm-hmm. they, they probably ran it, especially once they had a lead early in the rain. Uh, so we'll see, uh, but again, Winamax defensive priority is going to be having to stop Meister. They've got a good quarterback too, and Bobby Metzger, a junior quarterback, but not quite as experienced at, offensively as maybe what they've had in the past. Uh, defensively, they're just a linebacker factory. We've talked about this. Mm-hmm. They've just um, <laughs> they're a very very good defensive team who, you know, to kind of took their lumps earlier in the year, but they've really come back strong and won five in a row. Yeah. Line linebacker U for the yeah. LCC yeah. Knights so linebacker high school yeah. yeah linebacker HS yeah but I mean again I mean they they played great defense for a long time at yeah. LCC and you know five in a row and a very tough schedule so yeah that's that's an impressive uh, end of their season so it's gonna be a tough one do we know anything about uh, Jones will he be back for this week he will be out he will be out again in fact there's week. a good chance he is done for the year yeah. So that's that really stinks for Jaden, who yeah. was really playing well and had yeah. a great had a great great game against Caston. Yeah, yeah, playing really well. And but he uh, was a huge huge factor in those three wins. There. Yeah. So I'm curious to see if maybe Ka- Winnemac passes the ball a little bit more with Cash Roth. I mean, Max Gearhart's now playing receiver. He was the quarterback at the start of the year. He's playing receiver. They got another good receiver uh, in uh, Bentel, Jace Bentel. Okay. So yeah, might as well. Mm-hmm. You know, give it everything you got. Yeah. Again, yeah. Uh, you know they've. Winamax 0-3 all-time against LCC. All three of those games occurred in postseason games, including last year's sectional. And, of course, they had that 2020 regional game, which was just crazy. Mm-hmm. I think Winamax was up, what, 14 to nothing in that game, and LCC came back to win 37-32. Yeah. I think LCC's quarterback had over 500 yards passing in that game. <laughs> and then that 2012 regional game, which was such a pleasant surprise because Winamax was, you know, they, were, they weren't expected to win their sectional that year, but lost to an LCC team that wound up winning state. Yeah. They've done that a few times. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but again, if if Winnemac wins, they get a home game. Yeah, they would host the Rochester Zebras. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Winnemac cross country had a really good day. They were at Rensselaer. What a sensational day for both the boys and the girls. The boys were fourth, and the girls won their sectional. I don't think the girls were a huge surprise. The boys were a little bit of a shock. Yeah, to finish in fourth, and their their big three boys, Friedel, Pierce Chalski, and Guilford. All were within like four seconds of each other, all in the 1740s, like between 1742 and 1746. Hmm. That's great. I mean, that's, I mean, I, I, you know, I liked what I saw earlier in the year, but boy, they've, they've, they've all been getting faster. And all three of them under, under 18 minutes, all under 1750. I mean, hmm. that's just a great job. And then they've gotten enough, they've gotten enough from Joel Shawley and Corbin Holohan to give them a four and a five. They've only got five, so they don't get they don't have an, any buffer. They all five of them have to be good at, mm-hmm. at the, when they go to New Prairie for the regional. But yeah, I mean that was a great performance by them. Yeah, and then on the girls' side, a sectional championship, their second in school history. They won one in twenty twenty, mm-hmm. uh, and then they they do it again. Um, again, Maggie Smith. We've talked about Maggie all year. Another great job. Uh, but again, it's it's the pack. It's you know Hoover Croft, the two Wegner sisters, and then. A great sixth runner in Claire Goodman, who's—I mm-hmm. mean, she was in the top twenty, I think—and she's their sixth. Yeah, yeah. 
So what's the what's the chances there at New Prairie for the girls? Boy, it's going to be tough because you got all the region teams. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, and all the so you've got you've, all the Doonan teams plus you know teams like like Munster and Andrean and then and then um, you know and then of course New Prairie themselves. I mean, they're going to be they're, you know they're usually tough on their home course. Uh, Morgan Township is going to be there, and you know they're going to be formidable. Yeah. So I mean the. You know the Porter County Conference is a very good cross country c- conference. That's the team that bumped up and ran in the the three A and at the New Prairie Invite just yeah. to test themselves. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you got them, and then on the boys' side again, again, Valpo, Chesterton, Portage. I mean, they're yeah. Th- those teams are going to be really good. And you know, you got to be a, you got to be a top five, top five teams advance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> you got to run really, really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but New Prairie—it's a great course, and the Winnemac kids are certainly familiar with the course, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. as opposed to, you know, we were talking about Caston and Pioneer. How are they going to run at Brownsburg? We don't know much about the Brownsburg course. Right. Rochester and Valley running at the Plex and Fort Wayne—we don't really know much about the Plex. But New Prairie—we know a lot about New Prairie, and these kids yeah. are quite familiar with it. Yeah. So at least they got that. Yeah. Yeah. But boy, when Colby Wagner graduated, we're kind of boy, what's Winnemac cross boys cross country going right. to look like? Well, made it to regional. Heck yeah. of a job by yeah. by. Uh, Coach Bennett and his Adam Bennett and his uh, staff and those kids. Yeah, good luck to them uh, up there at New Prairie on Saturday morning. So, um, I think that's it. We had girls basketball start practice this week, so uh, we're going to give them another week and and let them kind of uh, feel out how things are going. And we're going to talk to some coaches. You're going to talk to some yeah. coaches early next week, and we'll probably do a little uh, preview show mm-hmm. for the uh, girls basketball on next week's Talking Sports with Val. Yeah. So. Once they get a little bit better idea of what they've got, and you know, some of them they're they're not, you know, possibly not going to have some volleyball players for a little while. So, pioneers volleyball players still in action. So we'll see, you know, if they uh, if they have another week off of basketball practice, or if they're going to be moving into the on the basketball court. So girls wrestling practice also began this week. Nice, and uh, Rochester, you know, girls wrestling program has just blossomed over the last four or five years yeah uh some tough graduation losses but a lot of good wrestlers coming back yeah yeah uh really looking you know kids like i think grace hirams is back lily gerald yeah Yeah. uh lily watson made state last year yeah should be a fun year yeah and they're going to be hosting uh semi-state for that is that right i say regional i don't uh I thought it was. I thought the semi state because be right, they're yeah. they're hosting the 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 one A. Yeah, you stumped me. I think on that. It's it's the first weekend in January where we'll have girls semi state on a Friday. Yeah. And then the uh, boys boys state the boys team state team finals state. on a Saturday. So they'll be they're hosting both of those. Yeah, they're hosting both. Yeah. yeah. And that, that that team state is going to be awesome. Yeah. That's going to be an awesome event. Yeah. And that's that's going to be at Rochester. So that's because mm-hmm. I think last year it was what over by. Uh, Crawfordsville somewhere? Was that Fountain Central? Franklin Central. Frank- Franklin Central? Okay. Or Franklin, yeah. South? Or Franklin Community. Yeah. And the year before it was at Martinsville. Yeah, yeah so, so this south of Indy. Yeah. yeah. So that would be up here. It would mm-hmm. be, uh, obviously, we're going to be covering a lot of that kind of stuff. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to bump up our uh, wrestling coverage. We've got, a, yeah, we got a lot of great wrestling in our area this year. Yeah. So. To look at. And. You know the the interesting thing is going to be the tournament, the route for the Rochester Zebras boys is going to be a lot different than it's looked the last few years. Yeah. So we'll talk more about that as well. So. Meanwhile, we know when the Rochester Tippecanoe Valley boys basketball game is going to be. It's going mm-hmm. to be Friday, December twenty second at Valley. Okay. So we weren't sure when or even if that game would be played, but mm-hmm. it, there will be a Rochester Valley boys basketball game. Yeah. It'll be the Friday before Christmas. Of course, the girls' game between the two is the Tuesday before Thanksgiving on Tuesday, November 21st. Mm-hmm. That's at Rochester, I think. I, th- I thought they were because the boys is yeah. at Valley. It was at Valley last year. The girls' game was at Valley last year. So yeah, so the, right. boys, the girls should be right. at home. The boys should be at Valley. We know that the rochester lewis Cass boys' basketball game will be Friday, January 12th. Okay. And then on the following night, the Lewis Cass girls will travel to Rochester on Saturday, January 13th. Boys at Cass, girls at home. Yes. Okay. Back-to-back nights. Okay. And back-to-back nights, that's kind of the, the old Valley weekend. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now it'll be the Lewis Cass weekend for Rochester. Okay. So, yeah, uh, we th- yeah, and uh, 
you know, we, I think we talked about the Rochester girls traveling to Clinton Central on Wednesday, December 20th. Mm -hmm. That's a new addition. Uh, the rest of the schedule, though, is a little bit unclear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll, we'll try and clear that up. And like I said, next week we'll talk some girls basketball as the season will be uh, getting underway. I think the first game's October 3rd. 30th, I think we have uh, the first. Yeah, October regular. 30th, you can play a game. Rach I know Rochester's season opener is home against North Judson on Thursday, November 2nd. Second, yeah. Who did I see playing on the 30th? Is that Winnemac that's playing on the 30th? One of our teams is playing on the 30th. I think it's Winnemac. Oh, on a Monday, okay. Yeah, I think so. Okay. One of them was. I can't remember which one it was. I know it's not Rochester, obviously. So, yeah, it's going to be here before you know it. We're already uh, 19th of October, mm -hmm. so not too far away. 11 days. So, all right, anything else here, Val? That's about it. All right, we'll wrap it up here. And again, tomorrow night, uh, we will be down at Indianapolis Bishop Chatard for the uh, first round of sectional 28 as the Vikings 9-0 and take on the number one team in 3A, the Indianapolis Bishop Chatard Trojans. I don't think I've ever covered a team, I don't think I've ever covered a high school football postseason game where both teams were undefeated going into the game. And I've been doing this for 19 years. Yeah. So I'm re really looking forward to it. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, it's just like we said, that's just crazy. Mm -hmm. that, that whole sectional is just crazy. So four 9-0 and o teams in that sectional. Mm -hmm. And the rest of them are pretty darn good as well. Yeah. Seven and two, uh, Garen Catholic is going to take on the nine and zero Peru Tigers. That's at Peru. Yes, at Peru. So mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, that uh, that'll do it for us here for this week. We'll be back next week and uh, talk some more sports. Mm -hmm. Night. <laughs>